On agenda this week, another Legislative Council hopeful sets out her cause. Chair of Arbury and Russian Parish Commissioners Kiri Jenkins has plenty of life experiences, but does she have what it takes to play an active, or perhaps more importantly useful, role in national politics? In the interests of transparency, I should point out that I work part-time for Arbury and Russian Parish Commissioners, on which Mrs Jenkins is a Commissioner and currently Chair. I began by asking Mrs Jenkins to tell us a bit about her background. I suppose um, the history goes back to when I was educated at Castle Russian High School. Um, I left school after my um, O-levels and went straight into the workplace. Um, I was very fortunate. It was the time when the financial services were taken off. It was exciting. There was a you know, massive growth in that area. And I found myself um, in Hong Kong working. Um, and that's where I met my husband, Philip. From there, I came back to the island. And um, I've worked for myself for quite a number of years um, in various um, different financial services. Um, setting up companies and um, in different jurisdictions and that sort of broad breadth of um, fiduciary and corporate governance and scrutiny is the sort of thing that I think I will bring um, to the role as an MLC. Um, Aside my sort of business interests, I've got a broad knowledge of different industries in the Isle of Man. I mean, I was born into a farming family um, at Moorhouse. My brother farms there now. My parents are still alive. And, um, you know, I do a lot of the company secretarial work and I know that industry well. And a few years ago, I was asked by Comin if I would go on to the Agricultural Marketing Society and swiftly took on the position of um, company secretary to again help with the sort of governance. And that was a very challenging time for the industry. It still is a challenging time. It was, you know, the the meat plant, obviously, it is well documented, the problems there. And um, it, it, it's it been, I suppose, a, a good rounded view of the sector and where the problems are. And um, from that, I think I've been able to support people through... Um, the Rural Support Group, which was an initiative that we set up right at the beginning of COVID. It was it became very evident that we were going to have to work swiftly and together with DEFA and the um, Farmers Union and, the, you know, the various horse societies and things to actually set up um, a support network. Nobody knew what was going to happen. We didn't know um, if we were going to be able to get... Um, the support in you know whether it be sheep shearers or anything like that and so we very swiftly set up this um, network and I was heavily involved in in getting that sort of um, up and running and you know helping farmers to be able to sort of help themselves if there was if there was a disaster Um, from from sort of like from experiences like that and and um, you know, get involved in various sort of political things. I, uh, my husband and I went up Timwald Hill a few years ago with a um, planning petition, um, and it was it was looking at the problems with planning and building control and other connected matters. And there was, I think, you you were, you were involved yourself, Phil, with a select committee that um, made seventeen recommendations actually to change the planning system. That really sort of took me on a journey into the sort of like political world and looking at um, acts and and looking at the way that um, it's structured and how it's it's supposed to help society not bash society if you like and and these discrepancies and and things that we were we were coming across you know I was I was going down lots of different rabbit holes if you like and and finding other things out which you know, I'm I'm very interested in research, and I and I enjoy that side of it. And so, um, quite I suppose 18 months ago now, um, I joined the local Arbury and Russian commissioners, and was very happy to to um, take on the role of chair. And um, from there, um, 
I, I ended up on the Southern Swimming Pool Board and that's been a huge challenge. Um, I think from when you're on the outside, you think these um, bodies are working as normal and then when you actually get in and start, you know, lifting up the stones, you realise that that not everything is as it would seem. So um, scrutinising what's going on there, forensically examining um, how these problems had come about has been quite an eye opener and, and and I've enjoyed it in a way in a, a you know dealing with um desk and the minister and and the DOI local government unit and everything has been um an interesting process and worthwhile and I think we're on we're on a you know a good road now um so I, hopefully that sort of public duty um you know I've shown sort of that I'm prepared to get stuck in and do hard work. And, you know, there's a lot of people, they do this work for for no payment. Um, and the other the other side of, of my life is um, charity work that I do, sort of marine conservation. There was a very um, good friend of ours in, who I met in Hong Kong who did a um, film about plastics um, called Joanna Ruxton. And she produced this film called... Um, a plastic Ocean, which which was like the you know the best selling Netflix documentary and and everything. And through her, you know, she asked me to go on the foundation that she'd created as a legacy for that film. And, and again, using sort of like in my fiduciary skills and and stuff. And that's been um, an amazing journey. Um, it's now um, become a global organisation called Ocean Generation and. You know, we may we may be a very small island, but we punch above our weight because that's it's a UK registered charity. But you know, the admin and everything is all done on the island, and you know that's given me amazing opportunities. I've been down to the Palace of Westminster with um, the Coalition for Global Prosperity, which is a, like a cross-party um, organisation, and we, you know, Sir David Attenborough was the keynote speaker with with Joe and that's given me sort of like I suppose this thirst for d for doing more and um, I've had lots of dealings with different government departments looking at legislation um, you know particularly with um, the swimming pool and uh, looking at the problems there and discovering what was going on with the local government act and, and you know we've got some you know bills that are coming up that are you know right up my street you know um tuesday i was in looking at the animal welfare bill and that was it's very interesting when you've got this breadth of knowledge to suddenly things that are popping into your head and going oh, i wonder if they thought of that you know could could that be improved that's what excites me about that that side of the role and, and what i mean what what do you actually think a member of Leg legislative council should be, um, because uh, the, there do seem to be a range of, of options depending on who you speak to. Absolutely, and I've I've met. I mean, I knew a lot of the MHKs before, but I've I've met um, a few that I didn't know over the last few weeks. And you're right; everybody seems to have a different view. I mean, my view before I started this journey um, was that it was purely scrutiny, and that um, you know it was it was a to challenge government basically and I haven't changed that view I I think that um, you know we need sort of like strong legislators we need um, good debate in Tinwald um, I've been asked over the last few weeks you know what do I feel about um, MLCs being in departments not in departments now before this process I would have always said well I don't believe that MLCs should be in department but it's quite interesting when some people put arguments to you that well an MLC if they've got a particular skill set that's desperately needed in a department um, should they be in there to, to take that department through that period when the general election happens for instance or follow you know bills through the different um, houses and I and I actually my, my view has slightly changed in that I feel that if somebody came to me with a really good reason why you should be in there, um, I don't believe you should be voting on policy, but I do feel that an MLC could add value in that way. Um, I don't believe that MLC should have 
policies and I know that um, some do go in with that with that outlook and, I, and I'm not one of those. But um, sh- surely, um, I mean, as a member of Tinwald, you are there to discuss uh, policy. You know, that that's what Tinwald's there for. So in, in essence, despite uh, some MHKs taking this view that maybe uh, members of Legislative Council uh, should be seen but not heard when it comes to policy, uh, actually, it is part of your role, isn't it, as a Tinwald member? Exactly. I mean, MLC is not elected by the public and I feel that um, although they're elected um, to represent the public, in my view, we should be representative of the public. So we should have a a cross section of the public in there as MLCs. I, I, you know, I I personally wouldn't want to see eight lawyers in there, for instance. Um, I think we need a cross section so that we can um, look at the proposals closely and um, look at the unintended consequences of that legislation and scrutinise it. And I do feel that um, the MLC should speak up and challenge. So if we see you know, the risk and reward and the risk is outweighing the reward but the government policy is still headed on a train in that direction. I do feel that we should challenge, and there should be more of that in the in the. Um, so, so effectively, more. what you're saying is you shouldn't discuss policy, but then you're kind of saying that maybe you should. So, uh, definitely or, or, debate it because yeah. I mean that's what Tyndall is there for. It's a debating chamber, and therefore, the MLC should be debating, um, and but they shouldn't be setting that policy that's been created by the House of Keys in my view. So it's um, more like a, a, a kind of a an opportunity to to government perhaps to uh, to have a rethink on, on a particular policy is that what you mean? Yeah and and to sort of like challenge the thinking if it's if it's out of kilter um, I think I think you know it's, uh, some things have rushed through don't they and it's always um, good to have a pause and a rethink and and look at it with a new light and a fresh perspective um, and not the the MLCs, I suppose, are in a, in a unique position that they're not answerable to constituents in a few years' time, and therefore they haven't got the challenges of what are their voters going to think, and so they can look at those difficult decisions with a different um, take on it. Some some keys members uh, now seem to think that some members of LegCo from their area should be representing their area. Um, are, are you basically saying that you would not represent any uh, anyone from Arbury? Um, no, Russian um, Castle absolutely. Tenable? I think uh, we have seen that in, in the last year or so, and and I don't think MLCs are representing any constituency. They're an all island um, representative. They're representing. They're representative of the people, not representing a constituency. Um. Okay, um, and and then I suppose in terms of uh, what you bring to the table, I think you've you've given some uh, uh, clues there uh, in, in your opening remarks. But uh, maybe we could explore a bit more. I mean. The your time in, in Hong Kong, for example. I mean, how, how many years were you over there? I was five years, which was enough time to find a husband, <laughs> bring him back. He's a brought over. Um, but I, you know, I'm widely travelled. Um, the um, businesses that I've had have been sort of worldwide, basically. So, you know, I've arranged conferences in Las Vegas and, and um, you know, Marbella and places like that. Um, and um, I've encompassed, you know, funds industry and the in- insurance industry and banking. And, and so I have that um, breadth of knowing what that sector um, is about. Um, but I also bring the sort of, you know, third sector and um, agricultural. And also, you know, my husband has tourist cottages. So... I know the troubles that are going on in the um, tourism industry um, at the same time. So I I do feel, you know, it does sound like I've got my fingers in lots of pies, but I think you need that depth and breadth of knowledge of the Isle of Man to understand what the consequences are for certain types of legislation. And, And we've got some critical legislation coming up in the next few years. What drives you politically? What drives me politically? Um... 
I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a. Um, I'm not a party politician at all. Um, and um, I believe in sort of like selflessness. Really, you know, all, all the sort of work that I've done, um, both in the third sector and and in the public sector, um, I've I've done for no payment. Um, and I want to do good. You know, this is this is where I was born. This is where my majority of my family is. And um, I feel that. You know, we're going to have a really tough few years coming up, and so, so I suppose then, what does good look like? What would good be? You know, if if you were successful and uh, and got elected to Ledgeco, um, what would what would uh, good feel like in five years' time? Well, for me, I mean, I've I've been through um, experiences with um, legislation where I've had to do the research and and challenge government as an individual um you know we've had um several issues that have have resulted in me having to do the research and challenging and i want that legislation to be accessible to all i don't believe that it should be written in such a way that you've there's only lawyers can understand it i mean you know i've i've challenge the government um, on quite a few different things as <laughs> you're not in your head there because you've been on the other side of it in the past um, I've never been frightened of, of writing a letter and pointing out when the officers are, have been wrong and they haven't followed their um, you know the act that they're supposed to be following so um, I suppose good in that way would be if somebody came up to me and said that I managed to do that because of this then that to me is a result because that's what I that's where my standpoint has always been so so I mean obviously as a Tinwald member um, I mean Tinwald is, is different to the Legislative Council the Legislative Council is specifically the the second chamber and it has that revisory uh, sort of role but in Tinwald you are an equal sort of voting member um, so presumably you'll have to have views on things like the government's economic strategy and uh, the Our Island plan and things like this. Uh, have, have you read them? Uh, have you, yeah, uh, I've read them and I think there's, um, there's certainly some things I would have challenged myself. Um, such as? Uh, well, <laughs> well uh, you know, um, certainly the, the um, 100,000 um, residents... Um, that they're aiming for there's a lot of work in the background um that's got to be done we're we're all aware of that aren't we living you know not being able to get doctor's appointments and things like that and i'm and i know where they're trying to get to what what i think would be really interesting is to challenge them on the sort of processes and the theory and and how they're going to get there um there's some very interesting um bits of legislation coming through there's um obviously you know energy security so the energy bill they've decided on Kroger, so we've got that coming through and i think my sort of entrepreneurial skills and business governance skills will start to come into play when we'll when i start to scrutinize some of this stuff coming through in practice because um you know, if you've if you've been in lots of different boardrooms, you start to understand what things you need to look for, and um, we need to head off any issues. So um, I'm quite looking forward to um, challenging and having those debates in Tinwald. Is I mean, I, I'm detecting a, a view that you. Well, I mean, I think it's pretty clear to anyone listening to this interview that you you are. Uh, keen to get in there and scrutinise, um, but is part of the role of any national po politician not to actually to, to to generate ideas on solutions to problems rather than just scrutinising uh, other people's attempts at trying to uh, tackle the problems? Well, you know, you know, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? When I've been talking to MHKs and um, quite a few of them. I've sort of wanted to use you as a sounding board and I and I see that as a really good role for an MLC because you're outside of that bubble and you know um, mentoring and has been one of my sort of skill set 
and I wouldn't have a problem if somebody wanted to bounce something off me. But I don't see MLCs as setting policy. We're not elected by the public. Um, and so if somebody came to me and said, oh, I've, I've had this idea, you know, I would I would look at it in exactly I I would in a business sense and weigh up the pros and cons. And if it's completely wacky, I would be honest to tell them. Yeah. And honesty in politics is, is often uh, quite a rare thing, maybe a little bit more prevalent behind closed doors than it is in public. Um, but but again, you know, the, the behind closed doors thing uh, seems to be quite prevalent in Tynwald. I mean, we, we heard about uh, last year, I think it was the, the secret briefings, uh, the, the private uh, briefings that Tynwald members get. Um, is, is there a danger uh, uh, to, to those that effectively all the debate happens behind closed doors and the public then don't get to find out what's going on? Yeah, I think that's I think that's the downside of that. I mean, I don't know why that's happening. I I would prefer to see total transparency on everything. Is it is it confidence? Maybe um, a lack of knowledge and not wanting to sort of be shown up. I don't know. Um, I guess I won't find out until I get there, will I? Yeah. Okay, and I, I, sadly we are you know, getting close to the end of the programme now um, I, and I've asked all the candidates so far what, what one thing would you, would you hope to, be, uh, or to, to achieve if you were elected uh, for five years? Some strong legislation that's, um, and that's secondary legislation so that it works for the people because um, certainly in my experience there has been some legislation that is not fit for purpose and I know it's been sat there waiting for changes for a long time and if we can get that through then that's something that I would be really happy to see done. So so specifically what kinds of things? Uh, certainly on the Local Government Act and uh, you know there's problems that occurred that meant we couldn't substitute members for instance and things you know getting into real technical little things here and um you know, when you talk to the officers and find that that's been sat there, they've known about it, but they've not been able to get it through. I think, I think that's the frustration, isn't it? Isn't it of, um, you know, knowing that something needs fixing, the officers know it needs fixing, and then where it comes in the um, timetable. Should LegCo members be elected directly by the public? Now that's an interesting one. I um. I've had a journey the last few weeks when, you know, talking to people about this. And it's quite interesting because if they were elected directly, in a way, they've got a bigger constituency than the MHKs and you end up with a, a super MHK. Um, and I'm not sure how that would work. Um, so I'd be really open to any ideas of how to improve the system. I definitely think it's it's quite difficult for candidates certainly seems uncomfortable for MHKs and it's clearly not working for the public either so you know should we be messing around with the housekeeping when there's all these crises going on I, I don't think so but does it need looking at some point probably and again I suppose you could argue that um, if the system isn't delivering then perhaps the system's part of the problem could be Finally, then, uh, one thing, one thing that uh, you 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 would say is the, is the most important um, part of your candidacy, the one thing that you would hope that Keys members would say, yep, that's that's why we should vote for Kerry Jenkins. Honesty, integrity, and not afraid to get stuck in. That was Legislative Council candidate Kerry Jenkins. So what do you think? Is Mrs Jenkins up to the role? Would your life be better or worse if she is elected? Of course, currently, you have no direct say in the matter as the election is wholly decided by the House of Keys. There's an opportunity for all Legislative Council candidates to appear on agenda and tell us what they stand for, so please get in touch if you know of any. For now, though, I'm Phil Gorn, Guramayo. Thanks for listening.